Hello and welcome. My name is Tim Boudreau, and I've been to Brazil a lot of times. I used to work on NetBeans, which is a Java development tool for Sun Microsystems. So I've traveled all over Brazil for that, and some of you may know me. And uh, today I work as a consultant, as an ar architect for a company that makes search software. What I want to talk about today is techniques for designing application programming interfaces, APIs. And this is a subject that isn't taught nearly enough, but it's pretty critical even if you're not writing something you think is an API that's not an official API, because you're still writing an API for yourself. You can still benefit from the things that I'm going to talk about. So the first point is that if you're coding, you are designing an API, even if it's only for yourself. Second is that there really isn't a style you should use when doing an API that doesn't also apply when you're writing any software. So some of this stuff is going to seem like normal programming advice, but really it is also part of making a good API and how to get good at that. And last is just that people sometimes get this idea that there is a fast way and that is different than the right way, but the only difference is whether you pay in time fixing something later or whether you pay in time up front. So what is an API? Well, this is a question that people think it's their, just their interfaces and that sort of thing. And when we were working on NetBeans, we found out the hard way that there's actually quite a variety of things that are API. For example, you could affect the way NetBeans started using a properties file. And so that is an API. It's named string keys and the spec for what it's supposed to be, but it's API. Command line arguments. Uh, I maintained the Node.js module for NetBeans, and recently their package manager changed the format of its output. Well, they didn't think of the output of the package manager as being an API, but I was treating it like one because it was available to me. So the point is that it's important to think about what you're exposing as API because anything you expose people can treat as API. But basically the rule is that anything that could break your users, your customers' software, if you changed it, is API. So why do I think this sort of thing is important? Well, the history of software evolution is really a history of libraries, of libraries getting so solid and so good that you don't even think about whether they are there or not. You never wonder if today your network interface is going to work. It works. It's a really solid piece of technology. You never wonder if today text encodings will be some different type of text because it's solid. It works. And what happens is when people don't learn good habits for software design and API design, is it's harder to write things that are solid that can become things that you can build on and build on and build on, which is what makes life better for all of us doing software and everybody in the world who uses our software. So the more we can do stuff that is reliable and the faster we can do it reliably, the better, ev the better off everyone in the world is. And lastly, there are a lot of habits which get taught especially when it comes to object-oriented design. There are a lot of habits that get taught when you take a class on object-oriented software, which sounded like good ideas in the 1990s. And we have learned since then that they are not such good ideas, but they are still in the textbooks. And it's not that some people want to teach you bad things. They just teach what they learned. So here are the things I'm going to go through in this talk. And this is really stuff that I have found works for writing APIs that do not break over time, that people can count on and use in the future. And also, these are practices that make it easier for me to write software that I can change without hurting someone else when I make changes. So having small interfaces, limiting mutability, so limiting how things can change and when they change and where they change, uh, using small types, very good use of types, and I'm going to go through each one of these things individually. Uh, using callbacks instead of locks, a lot of the things that are taught about doing concurrent programming really make it hard for people to write, good, write 
reliable programs. Separating API and SPI, that SPI means service provider interface. We'll talk a little more about that. And then that final and non-public should be the default. In other words, if you don't intend to expose it, if it's not useful to someone else, then it shouldn't be visible in the documentation, in code completion, in someone's IDE, and so forth. And lastly is just to break things up into small libraries that do one thing well, because you, get, you can combine those in interesting ways. So why would you want to have small interfaces? Well, you get to reuse more code for one thing. In other words, if you have a big interface, it's probably not good for a lot of things. It's, you know, if you have like even Java Util List, I'm going to go through that in a minute. It's very large. It's this very wide interface. And so that makes it harder to reuse things. Or if you do reuse it, there will be a lot of things that are not used. So another thing is just that if I show you an interface with one method, it's almost impossible not to know what it does. If I show you something with 20 methods, that requires some work. That requires, I am making you work. So to the nice thing to do for other people is not to make them work on something that is not important to them. So keeping interfaces small is very nice to human cognition because people, under, people can follow small things better. But it also makes it more powerful in the long run. So think when you're designing an interface or an abstract class, think of one method or two method. And if, if it's more than that, then maybe there's something wrong. Maybe there's something to look at. So it makes it easier for you to keep compatibility because there's less to keep compatibility with. So the result is better code. And the JDK is actually the source of a lot of bad examples. The listener pattern. Uh, even, so e even the parts that people think are good, that people say this is a good API, still have some problems. And the example I'm going to walk through right now is Java Util List. So that's considered, you know, that's part of the collections API. It's an interface. It's considered pretty good stuff, and in some ways it is. But it's, if you've ever actually implemented List directly on something, you'll know that it's very painful. And most of the functions like List Iterator, nobody uses it, but you have to implement it because it's part of the part of the contract. So you've got an array that's addressable by index. So you've got an array. You can get things out by passing a number. You've got a factory for iterators. It's a thing that can be empty or not empty. It's something you can add to and remove from. Something you can ask, does it have something? And it is a factory for arrays. Another thing that is sort of strange about Java Util List is that it treats mutability as the default. And mutability is the most potent source of bugs in software that exists. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like, what that actually ought to be. So we've got bounded. And we can agree that a thing with a size is bounded. So there's something with a number that is a size. It has something that has keys, and a kind of key is a number. So that's also something that a list is. It is something that's indexed, and that's really just keyed, but with the key always being a number. It's something you can query by key. You can get a, pass a key and get a value. And it's something that has numbers as its keys again for quer the queryable interface. You can ask it if it contains something, true or false. You can ask it if it is empty, true or false. And you can add and remove things. So that is really what a list is. But instead of being a collection of small interfaces, it's this big thing. And that means that it's more limited. For example, if a map really, at the end of it, if you do JavaScript at all, then you notice this. A map is really, or rather, a list is really a map where the keys are numbers, and they go sequentially. That's, that's what a list is. Now, if, you, if it were done this way, you would be able to write an interface called sorter that could actually sort anything. It could sort a map. It could sort anything you want instead of just being limited to lists the way collections.sort is. So the value of small interfaces is that you're able to combine things in novel ways, and you're not required to use all of the interfaces whether or not you need them. So the next thing I mentioned is mutability. 
So mutability is when something changes. You have a setter, you can set a value, you can change a value. And a huge source of bugs is things setting values, things setting them at the wrong time, or bugs caused by people trying to protect themselves from problems of people setting things in the wrong time. So we have an expression in English called for want of a, for the want of a nail, a shoe was lost, and for all the want of a shoe, a horse was lost, and for want of a horse, the war was lost. So this is something where small things lead to big improvements in reliability. And think about it. There's a lot of talk about test-driven development these days. And test-driven development is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Wouldn't it be nice to have less stuff to test? Well, there is a way. So final, the final keyword is applied to variables, is Java's secret weapon. Because it guarantees that this value will never change for the life of the object, it will not change. That lets, you, let, that lets the compiler help you, it lets the compiler ensure that that's never going to change. So you don't have to test for that, you don't have to handle the case it does, you don't have to have complicated threading code to make sure that it cha doesn't change while another thread is using it. All of that stuff just goes away. So final is the best keyword in the Java language and use it everywhere. It is really useful. So another, one of the things that happens if you don't have final stuff is as soon as you have a multi-threaded application, you have to know whether or not it's going to be, the object will be touched by multiple threads. If you need to touch it from multiple threads, then you need synchronization. Once you have synchronization, it is possible to deadlock. So there's all of these cascading problems that come, and the root is mutability. And usually, there are times when you want your data to change, but it's probably not one field at a time. It's probably a lot of things. So one of the things that drives me a little crazy is that an awful lot of Java frameworks are built around the Java Beans pattern. And Java Beans was invented in about like 1996 or 97 to solve the problem of UI components, buttons on the screen, components that respond instantaneously at looks different once you change something. You change a property and it's different. And, that, and Java Beans are a great thing for that. But they're completely wrong when you're modeling data that maybe came from the web as JSON or XML, or it came from a database where it's not supposed to change. It's just not. It, you want the data to faithfully represent what is in the database or what came to you. So the whole, I the whole idea that you use things that Anything, anything on any thread can set a value on at any time, that's, it's, it, it's insane. It's wrong. So when things do need to change, and sometimes they do, there are probably more things than one that do change. And if you need locking, if you need to do something for that, it's often cheaper to replace the entire model than it is to replace one field at a time of some object. And it's much safer that way because you know where everything can change and you know what can go wrong. So the real method message here is that setters are evil. Overridable setters are even worse because if somebody can subclass it, then they can call the setter before the object is initialized. And that's a whole other class of bugs that you get from having setters plus inheritance, which inheritance is also best avoided. So here's an example. And this is just a typical Java bean. It has one string called value, and it has a getter and a setter. So what's wrong with this? Well, for f this, is, this is what people get told to write when they're modeling data for frameworks like JSL or sort of thing. What's wrong with this? So first off, the value is null. Probably your code doesn't want to check if it's null. Probably you don't want to check if it's null everywhere in your code. That would not be fun. So probably with most people, they won't check everywhere. So then it can be null. So there will be a bug. So another thing is that we made someone type a lot of stuff. You know, I'm looking at this. This is not simple. This is not clear. There are a whole lot of words here. And there's only one thing that means anything. String value. That's all that actually matters. So it's not being nice to, to people to make them write this sort of thing because they, have, they could be spending time with their families and you know, building beautiful things. So it's common to want to implement equals and hash code, but this actually makes matters worse because now the identity is determined 
by the um, the identity is determined by the string value. So I put this into a map, and then I change its key to be the same as an an another value in the map. And really bad things will happen when I try to iterate that map. I actually chased down a bug once in NetBeans when multi when multi core machines were just becoming used, where I had an endless loop inside of a hash map because it is a linked list, and I had two things with the same key there. So. Object identity being able to change, bad thing. And lastly, and this is also true of the next example, um, hash code can actually throw a null pointer exception because I can do this first test, and it is not null. And then between the time that that instruction runs and value hash code runs, another thread sets it to null. And I will have a null polydure exception, and I will have a really hard time figuring out what happened. But it gets even worse. So now we want to make it thread safe, because other threads might touch it. So we will add synchronization. And we're implementing toString to return the value. That makes sense. But that means toString now contains a call to a synchronized method. And this is another bug that I have had to find and fix. So to string, in this last line here, it gets called by the logger. At some undetermined time in the future, we, pa we want to log something. We pass this object. To string will be called on it. It's going to synchronize. And if, the, if something else grabbed that lock, then you can deadlock. So you can deadlock by logging. Now, this is probably what that ought to look like. It's clear. It's simple. It can never be null. It's easy to read. It's easy to write. And you will not have threading problems. You will not have null pointer exceptions. Whole class of problems just disappear, all by using final and using not using synchronization, not using setters. So another thing is um, just thinking about combinatorics. When you add statefulness to any object, and you know, this is sort of com computer science 101, but if I have two bytes, you know, I, there are 16 bits. There are that many possible combinations. And if I add more, more well, the, the point I want to make is that every time you add one Boolean that can be set on something that can be changed on the fly, you've increased the exponent of the number of possible states your program can be in. So it's really something worth paying attention to. So here's another simple thing that helps in APIs and will just make everybody's life easier. So probably a lot of people have run into bugs where you have a function or a constructor, and it takes five strings or five doubles or ints or something like that. And you just get two switched. It's very easy to do. So this is a place where just tiny little Java classes, tiny little types that do nothing except wrapper a number are incredibly useful because this second version, all that class will look like is it will hold you know, a double or something like that. That's it. And it's impossible to have ordering problems with that. So this is another case like Final where you can let the compiler help you and you can write better software. And it's better for everyone. So another thing is uh, concurrency. So this was something that uh, I think, in particularly when I was working on NetBeans, we ran into a lot because it's a swing application. It has the event thread. And there's some code that's supposed to run on that. And there's other code that, uh, other stuff that you, like IO, that you really shouldn't do on the event thread. But this is true of anything which is, which is that if you just like synchronize all the methods on an object and make it and say, OK, now it's thread safe, that's really just making locking somebody else's problem. That's not solving the problem. So you can do a lot better if you actually have something that, uh, that you pass an interface, like a runnable, but it takes an argument. And then you run that on your own thread, in your own thread pool. You control the threading model, and they get called back at that point. And in the examples for uh, this talk, 
there are some, there's an example of that. And if you bear with me a minute, I will try to get it open. I'm using somebody else's laptop because I had some problems. So um, let's see. I think I actually put it in here. Yeah. So what I'm talking about there is really to write something that is like a, that is a very simple callback. And you can even generify this quite a bit. Sorry, we're, it's not a demo until something goes wrong. OK, so let me increase the font size a little bit. So, very simple interface that lets us receive some objects. So, say that I wanted to make sure that file I.O. only happened on some number of threads, so I never exhausted my number of open files. And I want to make sure it didn't happen on critical threads that have to be responsive, responsive to users, whether that's, whether that's handling requests from the web or handling the UI. So, basically, we do two things in here. One is, so you, the signature looks like you, you pass a file and something that will receive the, an input stream to touch the input stream. And you'll see here that there's something called paranoid input stream. And in fact, we're wrapping this in another input stream, which will make sure that we are only, the, it's only usable within the scope of where we were called. So that makes sure that someone can't just store the input stream in a variable and then use it when they're not supposed to. OK. So this was a simplified version of that. So another thing is to separate API and SPI. And this is something that we ran into in particular. You, you start running into this with larger applications. Anything that you want to make pluggable there are typically two faces to its API. So there's the, the API with a capital A. That is the thing someone calls to use some piece of functionality. But there's also the plug-in API, the service provider interface, the SPI, which lets people add logic to the system that does something. And uh, an example of that is that sort of gets this wrong is Java Mail. And if you've, if you've ever wondered why there are no good like mail clients written in Java, Java mail is kind of the reason. But what, um, what it did is, if you want to add a wire protocol to it, that's very easy. And if you're writing a mail application, like a, a, an email reader or something, that also, that you will end up touching, directly touching the classes from someone's IMAP implementation within your, the, within the mail API for just talking to servers. So it breaks the, it breaks the separation between the API and the SPI. And I've got an example of doing that here. Just one moment. So here's what you might have a mail API actually look like. So we'd have a mail protocol. And you'll notice that the API, the thing that someone calls if they are writing a program that reads mail, this is all final classes. This is stuff that you don't subclass. If you want to plug things in, then you would implement an interface. And what's special about that is that you can change, you, you can change things in different ways compatibly with an API and an SPI. So I can compatibly add methods to an API class. So if I want to go to our mail protocol class, I can 
add a method that does anything I want because it is a final class. So me doing this will not affect anybody who's already using the API. And another thing that's true, if I look at mail protocol here, this is my SPI. Now, only, only this library ever calls the SPI. I never give that directly to users of the API. So if I decide that this method, whoops. Uh, it's been a while since I've used a Mac. Um, <laughs> so if I wanted to remove this, what happens? Well, I, d I have not broken compatibility with anything because nothing except providers ever implement that interface. So an old implementation is still binary compatible. If they use the at override annotation, it may not be source compatible, but it is binary compatible to remove a method from the interface. It just means that there's one method that will never be called in implementations that have it. Now, if there were one class, if I just told everybody subclass mail protocol, then I can't remove things because I don't know if somebody's calling them. And I can't add things either because I don't know if somebody's implemented something with the same name and a different return type, which, in fact, the JDK itself did that to us when we, we, we had an exception get cause in JDK 1.3, and JDK 1.4 broke that. So just adding methods to a non-final class is, an is a binary incompatible change, and that's a good thing to remember. See, at, at Sun, at NetBeans, we sort of, we were acquired by Sun, and we had these APIs, and suddenly we were under a regime where thou shalt keep compatibility for eternity. And we were like, oh, we weren't expecting that. So we had to learn ways where you could design APIs where you could keep compatibility so that we could deprecate the stuff that we really, you know, had turned out to be a bad idea, but not make new mistakes in the future. And that's where a lot of this comes from. So something that drives me nuts is that in any ID, including NetBeans, if I say new Java class, what do I get? I get a public class. What I'd suggest, change this to final. That should be the default when you create a new class, and then when you find a reason to expose it, expose it, make it public then. Really helps, because it's also hard on people who have to look, who, if I, if I have documentation, and there are 20 classes in a package, but only one of them is useful to me, uh, that wasn't really nice on the part of the person who wrote that. They could have trimmed it down and created a better experience for everyone and had more happy people using their API. So lastly is, uh, or next to lastly, is factor things into separate projects, factor things into libraries. So small libraries that do one, do one thing well is really, really, really valuable. You can get a lot more use out of code. So for example, and if I had my, if I had my laptop, I would have a better example, but at least I can show something. So. Let me see what I've got here. OK, I'm sorry. I don't, on this machine, I don't have the stuff that I need to really demo that properly. So uh, we'll have to move along a little bit. But the basic idea is you know, if you have something that does one thing, and uh, example like I've got a little library that does file I.O. And it just does fixed length records of objects, not using Java serialization, but fixed length so that you always know how many bytes ahead is the next object, kind of 1960s programming. And I thought, you know, I was doing this for one purpose, to record telemetry from a camera, uh, well, basically a device that goes down oil wells. And I thought, you know, there's a general pattern here. So what I did instead was add, created a couple annotations you could put on constructor arguments so that you could take any object and make a fixed length record file out of that 
and you also use the separate, a separate implementation that would put individual objects in individual files. And now I've reused that you know, 10 or 20 times. And if I had just written the thing for that one project, that would have never happened. It would have been much less useful. So I wish I could show it to you. Unfortunately, I can't right now. But if anyone wants to look at stuff after, I'd be more than happy to. But basically, the idea is that you know, if everything, every piece you, of code you write for one project becomes an API that you use in other projects, and you get to write new stuff faster, and get to reuse code more. And that means getting to solve the interesting problems instead of the boring problems. And lastly is um, a lot of people get the idea that, that Java generics are really just a thing you use with lists and sets and stuff. And they are so much more than that. So say that I've got a class called configuration, and I want to load it from disk, a database, whatever. So I might write something like the one on top here. But actually, it's probably, you know, it's probably something like JSON or you know, there's some file format here, and there's something that reads it. There's probably a more general pattern, which is I just want to load a particular class. And uh, presumably, I know that the thing I'm asking it to load from works for that. So the idea is to just like notice when there's something that could be generic, that there's a general pattern. And use the general pattern rather than the more specific pattern. You can, always, you can always make a subclass that looks like the upper one of the more general one. And the more general one, you'll get to reuse again and again. So this is running a little short here because uh, without my laptop, a lot of the demos didn't work. But uh, if anybody has any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. And we have translation for the questions. Um, this little receiver is not on. Hello. Uh, OK, in English. Uh, let me see. I got this annotated. Oh, OK. Hello. About the Java Bean uh, approach, uh, we know that we have several uh, frameworks that, that are based on that approach, you know, to, to to improve setters and, and getters to to, inter to make interface with the, that kind of objects. What is your opinion about that? I, I, think it's a, I think it's a mistake. It would be nice to use frameworks, try to find frameworks that don't force you to have setters. A lot of things like, like Jackson for JSON, it, if you use annotations, you can have it use final fields and constructor arguments. So a lot of frameworks that marshal data from XML or um, or like JSON or something like that, they can do that. You just have to ask them to. Uh, I mean, I, th this is something that needs to change, and I, I hope that so you know talking about this is one of the ways we get it to change. But it's really true that a lot of frameworks do expect people to write code like this, and the crazy thing about that is that then people write less reliable stuff, and it's harder to maintain. So. Where possible, try to find some, some way around that. And uh, with a lot of frameworks, it is possible to use, annota like use annotations to map a, a, property, a constructor argument to a property, and then you can have things be final. And it's just safer. You know, then, then you never have to write a test whether something changed, because it can't. Oh, OK. Thank you. Good, in, good, good afternoon. Uh, it's very usual that uh, when you are learning Java, most of the places teach to use getters and setters. Do you recommend in any situation to never use it? I don't know what to tell you except that the people teaching it this way sh should stop because it's really, uh, it's, not valuable. Yeah, I know. I know. 
it, it, we, need, we need crazy people like me saying, don't do that, please. But basically, if in small applications you never run into the problem, it's not until you get to writing something that is really, you know, big. Something that, you know, is, it's your job to write or something that's like going to be used by a lot of people. It's when you end up with working on things that are big that it starts to become a problem. So it looks nice when you're learning. It's when you actually try to do this stuff in production, it turns out to not be nice at all. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I would just say and encourage educators not to teach it that way anymore. Or you can decide I'm crazy, but I don't think I'm crazy. Other questions? Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, when it comes to public APIs, uh, sometimes programmers are lazy and they don't really implement uh, error handling routines and so on. So one approach I've heard to handle this is to uh, deliberately return errors sometimes in a public API to make sure that the developer eventually faces them and, and handles them properly. Do you think that is a valid approach? And do you, uh, can you suggest some other approaches? Because it doesn't sound right. <laughs> Do you mean return errors, or do you mean throw them? Uh, well, I'm thinking about public-facing API, so maybe uh, an HTTP API would return uh, an error. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're using HTTP error codes correctly, so you're, you know, it's like a 400 bad request or a 500, then you know, as, long as, as long as they can tell that it's an error and it's not the data they asked for, then that's good, because yeah, a lot of people don't don't do that right, and it really is important. To, uh, if if something goes wrong, you don't get to just say, "Huh, oh, something went wrong." You know, it's, you have to have to say what. That's very important. I agree completely. Do you see any alternatives to actually deliberately returning errors? Because that might sound counterproductive sometimes. It it depends on if the client can do something about the error. So. If it's possible for the client to recover, or you know, try it again later, or something, then it's useful. If you know, if it's really catastrophic, or something is, you know, someone pulled the network cable out to the database, you know, then well, 500, you know, I'm broken. Fix me. It's probably the best you can do. But if it's something somebody can do something about, then give them the chance. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back in Brazil.